The, our second speaker is Dr. Mario Agnoletti. He's an associate professor in the Department of Management Systems, Agriculture, Food, and Forestry at the University of Florence. He teaches production, process, and landscape planning. He's uh, of agricultural systems and environmental history. He works with FAO, UNESCO, Ministry of Agriculture, and numerous other environmental programs. Uh, and he's edited a, a series of uh, books that are in publication on these subjects. Today he'll speak to us on the Tuscan landscape as cultural heritage when sustainability needs a little help. Mario, on, on your left. Well, basically here we will have a, ch a change uh, in the perspective compared to the previous uh, speaker. Uh, from gardens uh, to landscape, that being in Italy uh, at the end uh, it's not so so different, I would say, but of of course uh, there is there are differences uh, in the way uh, a rural landscape, so a large portion of a territory, is managed. So as as I hope I will explain, uh, uh, once that we are not inside the garden. So I was saying that when you go from the garden to the landscape. There is a change of scale. That means that uh, in a garden, normally you are in a private home. So basically what you do depends on yourself. Your management, it's up to you. But when you are outside in the open territory, then you are instead uh, in a different framework where uh, international and national, in the case of Italy, since we are in Europe also international, laws applies. So there are views that have been developing what the landscape is, and then uh, laws have been developed according to these views, and so it's not exactly the same thing. So the difference, uh, it's, uh, it's important, and because also on these differences is based uh, uh, the different perception that people have. So once you are in a garden, you expect to see a humanized place, uh, once you are in the landscape, uh, you do not always expect to see a humanized place, and uh, this makes a difference in terms of international regulation. But, uh, and as uh, in the introduction I was saying, I am working on this at uh, a different level. Mm, I've been working for many years for the regional government on Tuscany. Then I've been appointed chair of a commission at the Ministry of Agriculture in Italy, who's in charge of developing policies for the rural landscape. And later I started to work with uh, some United Nations institutions like UNESCO, FAO, and the CBD, which is the Convention for Biological Diversity, working on the same topic. So uh, for me, it's been interesting to uh, analyze all the different perspectives and different way uh, people in this different uh, institution. Uh, it's, it's been uh, developing also uh, legal tools for protecting landscape. And also, I've been traveling a lot around the world, about 60 countries, for according to my job. This is also giving me the opportunities to see all these differences that we have. Okay, so uh, as I was saying, it's interesting to see that the landscape is being growing in the recent year, as an interesting uh, perspective. It's been growing in many, many different ways. Uh, uh, initially, there was UNESCO taking care of the cultural landscape, because my speech is about cultural landscapes. And then we have also the Convention on Biological Diversity taking care of landscape. Uh, we have FAO, who developed a world program for protecting rural landscape. Uh, we have the Common Agricultural Policy in Europe, which is subsidized farmer to protect the landscape. And most recently, in October last year, the United Nations organized a global landscape forum. So it seems that this is becoming uh, an important issue, which is makes different compared to the past. Why? Probably, finally, we are recognizing that landscape uh, is, is probably a very uh, good uh, way of taking care of the social, economic, and environmental system. So is the concept integrating uh, all these different, different processes? And of course, in time and space, because landscape is not a photograph. It comes from 
somewhere in the past and it goes into the future. But this is probably what uh, the re one of the reasons why it's becoming so interesting. And Tuscany, of course, is a place where the human print on the landscape has a long history here in a land where the Etruscan already developed an interesting way of cultivating, for instance, the vineyard, mixing together trees and vines, uh, the mix of cultivation that the Romans found when they uh, invaded uh, Etruria. And of course, this uh, it's, uh, can be considered the foundation on uh, an idea that came much later in medieval time, which is the idea that uh, the wise management of a territory, as you see in this painting of Lorenzetti, which is shown in Siena in the uh, town hall, uh, present uh, a, a landscape which is completely managed and ordered. Every detail is there for a reason. Either it's a forest or a vineyard or a cultivated field. And so this was the strong idea that came out from those period ages. Uh, as a matter of fact, this idea was opposed in the, the other painting of the same author to the bad management of a territory, which we could say represent, beside uh, there is an army here, there are houses on fire, uh, more or less wilderness, because the two Difference are really evident. So here is a garden, I would say, although we are not really into a garden, but the idea is to have a very fine-grained landscape where any single detail is important. And we find this idea also in the Toscan Villa, as you see this painting from Gusto Utens of the Medician Villa of Colle Salvetti. I would say that, yes, okay, Inside the villa, you can clearly see uh, agricultural cultivation, uh, vineyards and uh, olive orchards, but there is not much different with the outside. The inside, the outside, the same idea, the same concept. And also, this is what the many uh, travelers to Italy, they came between the, to visit our country between the 16th and 19th century, the so-called Travelers of the Grand Tour, uh, noticed and described. And in very enthusiastic terms. I still remember when I first read the, the description of, of Joseph Spence in 1740, the Arno Valley is one of the most beautiful valleys in, of the world, which is perhaps too much, but what was impressing all these people were the cultivation. Everything was cultivated from the valley to the top of the mountain. And of course, these people uh, came from areas where they also had agriculture, but not like this, in a different way, in a different form. So everything was very much cultivated, but also taking care of the details. Uh, and at the end, they were astonished by the beauty of all this. So if this is uh, the idea, it means that, as uh, later we noticed the definition of cultural landscape by the American geographer Carl Sauer, the cultural landscape is fashioned from a natural landscape by a cultural group. Culture is the agent, the natural area, the medium, the cultural landscape, the result. So if we all agree that this is a, a correct definition of cultural landscape, we also agree that according to Emilio Sereni, the most important Italian historian of uh, agricultural landscape, he wrote that the rural landscape is the form that man, in the course and for the ends of his productive agricultural activity, consciously and systematically impose on the natural landscape. So the forms. It means that we are applying forms. And the result is something that we enjoy. Culture has modified nature, and we like that. So I could stop here in my presentation and say, we all agree. Fine. So everything should proceed accordingly. And not exactly. Uh, let's see, uh, to understand what I want to say, uh, let's look at the evolution of the Italian landscape and the Tonskan landscape in the past few years. Here, I'll show you this graph showing the, from 1911 to almost nowadays, the farmed land, population, and forest. And basically the message here is that we have lost the half of the farmed land in Italy. Italy is 30 million hectares, so we have 24 million hectares of farmed land. Uh, we have about 12 today, and we have a big increase in the forest. And if you want 
to know some more numbers, abandonment of farmland, 100,000 hectares a year. Woodland increase, 75,000 hectares. Urban sprawl, which is the things that most of the people notice when they travel around, uh, urban areas are increasing. I would say only, of course, it's not only, <laughs> but compared to the rest, minimum. So the most important thing happening in our landscape is abandonment, uh, which means uh, a huge transformation from what we could call a cultural landscape that has been there for centuries or for a couple of millenniums, to something else where people is concentrated in big cities. The, this cultural landscape, this rural landscape we're describing is reducing. And this just to analyze what is happening for now. Then we can proceed and explain, of course, that this is happening basically for economic reason. Less people work in agriculture, more people working first in the industry and then in service industry. And this is the economic explanation. The rural landscape, as any landscape, is a product of the economy and the society. As the society changed, the economy changed, and the landscape changed. And if we look at what we just said, uh, com considering just urbanization, also Florence has its own problem. Uh, from 1954 to nowadays, uh, we have the double of the urban area, but the same amount of population. It's an interesting phenomenon. You might expect that we have more people living there. No, we are always about 380,000 people living in Florence, uh, but the double of the urban areas. This can be explained in sociological terms, but this is not the, the topic I want to address. And considering Italy, as you see, these gray areas are those where the, all this urban development are concentrated. So uh, the, basically what I want to say is that urbanization occurs just around big cities. In the rest is more abandonment, which is happening. Abandonment, which is caused, as I say, by the fall in the demography, especially in the high hills and the mountain. And if we want to go more to see in the details what we have, it's just from this uh, rendering, this is a virtual landscape. It's designed, made to explain what is, what was in the past uh, a farmhouse in Tuscany where you had different kind of cultivation. You have the chestnut forest, which is a cultivated forest. You have a wood pasture, which is a cultivated forest for grazing. And you have uh, wheat fields and terraces and also different forms of trees because the interesting thing about Italy that since Roman times, also the forest was cultivated. There's not one single inch of the Italian forest territory that has not been managed in the past. And so, of course, when we abandon this, when we go, away when the people abandon these areas, we have this. So it's evident that in, uh, from many different points of view, but we'll go this later into more details, a lot of people, I would say the majority, would consider this a positive phenomenon. If you want to have numbers considering Tuscany, we have lost 85% of the landscape diversity in mountain areas and hills for this problem. Because if you go back here, of course, we, as a high, we have a higher complexity of the landscape mosaic. In this case, we have a, an homogeneous forest cover where you may find a lot of the biodiversity that many of us like, but it's not a cultural landscape. And if you go more in the topic of agriculture, industrialization have also created changes in the landscape. Here we go from uh, an area in San Gimignano, 1954, where we have really a fine grain landscape, a complex puzzle, I would say, a mosaic of different patches. Land uses and patches combine all together, create all these uh, differences. And with the changes we have in agriculture, we pass to a coarse grain landscape. So it's the same place, exactly the same area. If you take care of the details, you still recognize the roads, and some of the structure of the fields, but larger. Uh, why? Because globalization is working in many different ways. Basically here has been working with technology. We have used the same technology, we are using the same technology all over the world. This technology is making the landscape more homogeneous. Mm, my father bought one of these machines, and in order to work in an area like this, he had to change the structure of the landscape. He needed large fields, with no trees, because all these tiny little patches, I'm not sure you can see the detail, have rows of trees hmm? in the Truscan way. 
with vines, olives, maple, poplars, elms, all together. And so when it happened that you want to create this for having a high production of wheat, then you need this machine. But what is happening? It's happening that this is the economy, and of course, we are living in a rural economy, so farmers want to go for a better life. Uh, what we find out uh, is that uh, once that globalization of course, is not only happening because of machinery, but because you can exchange your crops, your trading all over the world. So if I start to import uh, corn or wheat from the US or from Ukraine or from Kazakhstan, I found out, my father found out, that was no way he could compete on the price. No way. Whatever he did, for him, as many farmers, he was a disaster. Because they've invested in money, loans from the bank, and everything to try to be better off with this kind of uh, input. At the end, they found out that they spoiled the landscape, and they were not doing better. So for, for Italy, not only for Tuscany, there's been a change going from an attempt to industrialize to the consideration that we could go only for quality. The quality of the food, a nice niche, let's say, an ecological niche, where we can find us with better chances to be more competitive. But of course, putting together not only the food, and today this is happening, but more and more the quality of the landscape, as far as long as we have a good quality landscape. Another example. This is a, an old castle, Castello d'Albola. Podere Marangole, Chianti, the heart of winemaking in Tuscany, 1977. Here, uh, just to tell you, you have uh, stone terraces, dry stone terraces with olive trees and vines. Technically, this is a vineyard, according to the statistic of the time. Then a big entrepreneur came because Tuscany and Chianti is good for wine. Hmm? Everybody knows. Well, that's it. That's the result of a, applying an industrial idea to wine production. Technically, technically on the cadastre, this is still a vineyard. And if you look to the register, the land register, you find the same description, vineyard, vineyard. But the landscape is totally different. So what is happening? Of course, these kind of landscapes are the same all over. At the end, what is really remain different is the morphology and uh, the monuments or the architectural element. You see, this typical farmhouse of the mid of the 18th century is remained there as the castle, but the form impressed by the man to the natural basis, as Sereni was describing, have changed. And this for what concerned the vineyards, and if we apply this to the entire region of Tuscany. We, I was in charge of developing a sort of monitoring system for Tuscany, so we selected many study areas, and we observed that this uh, was happening in many places. And uh, of course, there are also the good landscape there, but we could clearly see that these trends were occurring and they were continuing in Tuscany. And these are important thing because from the point of view of industrialization, you might be surprised to know that here in Tuscany in the past two years, especially in the past month, we've been discussing on the newspaper about the new landscape plan that the regional government developed. And the plan was stopped and changed because it was saying exactly what I've been telling you, that we reduce this kind of industrialization because we are spoiling one of the, our most important resource. Just to give you numbers, Tuscany in the past four years, there are the years, the years of the big economic crisis, have lost 20,000 jobs in the industry, 16,000 jobs in, in services, but plus 5,000 in tourism. Agriculture is down to 1.8 of the gross domestic product. Tourism, it's up to 10.5. So, as a matter of fact, it's tourism driving agriculture. And this is because people like the landscape, like the places, they come, they visit, they buy. Because you might remember some of the Tuscan wine, let's say, that are famous all over the world. But if you consider the entire territory, it's as little what people enjoy is to visit, to go around. 
And this is not really understood by the regional authorities, especially in agriculture. And according to this first uh, study, I was appointed for a bigger one to do all across Italy. This was an investigation developed, tried to establish from one side some kind of protection for the Italian historical rural landscape, and also to make a sort of health check. Let's see how they are, who's taking care of them, how the protection that already existing, there are many forms of protection, it are taking care of them. And so we have selected 126 area, and what we have found out that in all this area there are many different typical products, so food creates landscape, uh, observation, but for us it was important to put together the two just for the purposes of valorizing this area and show how good food can also produce good landscape. But we also took care of the uh, threats, the vulnerabilities. And so you see the researchers, 80 researchers from 14 universities, uh, agreed for what for, with what we already observed for Tuscany. Abandon, human pressure means uh, uh, urbanization and forestation occurring in most of this area. Interesting to see that there are also renewable energies considered like a threat here on the last position. And so this was uh, really interesting because what was happening in Tuscany was happening all over Italy. But then what is protection doing? So we have many areas under the protection of the Ministry of Culture, which is the landscape code. But uh, surprisingly, uh, the Ministry basically protect buildings. For the open territory, they protect the forest. In other terms, you are abandoning this vineyard and uh, the forest grows on the abandoned vineyard. The landscape protection that we have, according to our ministry, is for the forest. If you change a vineyard, like these uh, historical terraces that are there since uh, medieval time, with a totally new vineyard, no Ministry of Culture, no landscape restriction applied. But vice versa, if you remove the forest, because under the forest canopy there is an old terraces, you go to jail. And so, analyzing the result, we notice that in the areas where we do not have a landscape restriction, we have a, a much smaller percentage of abandonment. While in the area where we do have landscape restriction, abandonment is higher. So, from the point of view of the Ministry of Culture, really the tools that we have do not apply. Uh, let's go in the protected areas. We are in the Apuane Mountains here, in the regional park of the Apuane Mountain. You see the difference between these two photographs. But let's see the assessment of the protected areas. Protected areas, same. Uh, compare the abandonment outside the protected area system and inside, you see that there is a big difference as the forestation. Uh, it's easy to understand this. Protected areas as protected the environment, nature. They're not protecting the cultural landscape. They're protecting the wilderness and the wild habitat. And one of striking case, just for those of you probably that have visited the Cinque Terre, we are in a national park. And inside here you see that uh, there is the forest growing on some of this uh, incredible, amazing abandoned terrace on such steep slope that you'd be, be uh, surprised and uh, wondering how it has been possible to build all these terraces. Well, here we try to develop a restoration pro project uh, with the most important uh, Italian foundation for the prote protection of landscape and uh, environment, which is the Italian Trust for the Environment. So we wanted to go from here, this is the situation that was there three years ago, to here, just following uh, historical investigation. Before, there was this, because we could analyze with the aerial photograph and uh, document how it was the landscape in the past. So, th this is a total of four hectares, 4.5 hectares. In order to achieve the permission to do this, there was intervention of the Minister of the Environment, the President of the Regional Government of Liguria, as well as many technicians, to take a decision that was going against the indication of the park. 
so just we can stop and say, what is happening? Well, it's happening that ideas are changing. Uh, we were discussing before the idea of culture dominating five century, the grand tour, people visiting Italy, enjoying uh, and looking at how the man has been uh, modifying the environment, domesticating nature, but the things have changed. And the things started to change uh, at the end, the second half of the 19th century uh, for the combined effort of some, uh, I would say, thinkers and writers and some scientists. Each one, for their own part, started to develop a reflection on how, basically, on how the man was degraded in the environment from the scientific point of view, taking as a, as a reference uh, the first, perhaps the most important work by Clements on plant sociology and the climax theory. So the idea that there is a, a natural vegetation developing in an area without intervention of the man, and this uh, gives us a reference for trying to understand where to go according to a sustainable management uh, of, the, uh, of the environment. And also other people working on this. Basically, the result of all this development is they said that man is a disturber of nature. So the man is a danger. And if we take nature as a reference, this is good for idea of what sustainability is. And the interesting thing, because probably one of the most important person in this list was John Perkins Marsh. The interesting thing for me is that Marsh was a, a US ambassador in Italy. He's been living here for 25 years. He died in Vallombrosa, uh, the, the Italian school of forestry, not far from Florence. And it's interesting because uh, in his book, he's speaking about how man has been degrading the environment, but he was not like Thoreau living in the US. He was here for 25 years. So he was here as Goethe, Stendhal, Montesquieu, as Hawthorne. He looked the same thing, but he, he had a completely different view. And this is striking, because he is considered uh, the father of environment, one of the fathers of environmentalism. And I'm in uh, environmental history, and in environmental history, most of my colleagues would take him as a reference for considering when we started to analyze the, the, man, the relationship between man and nature. And so this is, uh, <laughs> gave rise to a number Thing. I'm running fast through history here, but uh, international regulation after the Second World War started to be developed on the protection of the environment, protection of nature, basically the Stockholm Declaration 1972. Before, there was also the Club of Rome uh, that occurred in this year. But at the United Nations level, these were the decisions were considered important. The Brundtland Report in 1984, which is a huge report on the degradation of the environment at world level that popularized the concept of sustainable development. Then we have the UNESCO Convention protecting, protecting natural and cultural heritage, but monument at that time, not cultural landscape. And the Rio Declaration of 1992, perhaps the most important one, was introducing a working document called Agenda 21, which is more operational compared to the rest of our Declaration of Principles. And in this, we find, finally, not only mentioned landscapes, but also indigenous knowledge, traditional practices, uh, cultural identity, which means that something is there that can be taken uh, for helping us to protect uh, the cultural landscape. And even in uh, UNESCO, what we had is, is a, a change. Cultural landscape, the protection of cultural landscape were introduced in 1992, together with the Rio Declaration. So before there was no cultural landscape protection, there was no, the convention was not taking care of them. But being an expert for them and working for them when we make the assessment of the area, I was recently in Bourgogne because Bourgogne is uh, presenting a dossier to be nominated in the World Heritage as a wine region. But even in that case, the forests surrounding the vineyards, many forests, majority are forests, are all considered natural area, natural habitat. And as a forester, I'm a forester as a background, I would say that they are completely cultural, as I would see here in Italy. And also in, 
FAO, we have the same approach. It's useless to go into detail, detail but the program protecting the rural landscape has, I would say, a more important uh, uh, perspective about the so-called natural capital rather than on the agricultural practices. And if you go to Europe, Europe was already declaring in 1999 that most of our territory is a, a cultural landscape, basically, and only 5% five, five can be considered natural. But Europe developed one of the most important, the most important uh, protection system that we have in the world, the Nature 2000, which is basically a list of protected areas all over the countries, covering eight, between 18 and 20 percent of the European territory, territory, which is considered as natural. So uh, we have a problem. Five percent here and 20 percent here. Mm, what is happening? Probably. Uh, some cultural areas have been introduced in this document. As well, you see as the common agricultural policy, which is, of course, included landscape, but in the ecological focus area. So according to the people of the commission, the one in the uh, general directory of environment, landscape is a part of the nature protection, of environmental protection. So here, as often happens, we are overlapping two concepts that for many people are more or less the same, but in practice are not really the same. And in fact, Europe has also the European Landscape Convention, was signed in Florence here in the year 2000, but we do not have a landscape directive. We do have a nature protection directive, so the operational document which is compelling the member state to save the habitats, Italy is doing the same. There is not a similar directive for the landscape. And when I was appointed by the Council of Europe to discuss with the European Union the development of a landscape convention, they told me, but we are really protecting landscape with the environmental legislation and nature 2000. Okay, so uh, there were not, there was not really a ground for further discussion. If they believe they are already protecting the landscape, <laughs> I can only try to show them with scientific production that is not true. If we go to the protection of forests, because Europe has also a huge program, it was developed after Rio de Janeiro for protecting the forest. So the three pillars of sustainable forest management are ecological value, economic value, social and cultural value. Social and cultural values were introduced in 2002. This and this has something in common. They like the forest to grow. They both agreed that the forest should increase. The more dense, homogeneous forest cover we have, the better it is. And in fact, if we go to see the situation all over Europe, I was explaining you Italy, but let's take Austria, let's go further north to Sweden, same thing, forest is growing. 800,000 hectares, sorry, this is a mistake, this is a zero missing, all over Europe, which has this interesting consequences if you think at the relationship between food and landscape. We are importing more and more food from abroad. If you have the forest, you don't, cannot have the food. So is that cultural landscape is the result of food production, it means that you need to have the man developing farming somehow, or at least cultivating the forest. So in this cultural dimension, the forest really had little attention. They only introduced in these uh, rules for sustainable forest management some indication for cultural and spiritual values, meaning that there are some sites inside the forest that has a special cultural meaning. In this case, these are buildings in an area uh, they were built in the 16th century, so this is a cultural site. The, other, the rest of the forest is a, a natural habitat preserved by the European Commission. Unfortunately, this is a chestnut uh, orchard planted in the 12th century. So this is what is happening. And in fact, well, I don't want to spend too much time, but the guidelines for the implementation of social and cultural values in sustainable forest management that the Ministerial Conference did ask us to produce when they were presented, they correctly found out that there were two contrasting philosophies. One 
was saying that we should go for natural habitat or for preserving the production of the forest. And you could not introduce also cultural and social value without changing the other indicators. So this document is remained there. They use it for some uh, purpose, correct purpose, I hope, but it's uh, there. So at the end, what I want to say is that this has been always considered in the past decade as a positive trend. And, and so, uh, if we are considering cultural landscape, we have problems. And we have problems also in maintaining farming, for the reason I told you. We have problems because although we all like a lot of biodiversity, when these uh, friends arrive uh, in the countryside and in the farm areas, they cause us a lot of dam damages to the cultivation of beside the money, 12 billion uh, euros only in Toscany. We have strange situation here, one kilometer from here, in the Villa di Maiano, a group of wolves uh, <laughs> killed uh, the sheep that the owner was keeping uh, in his olive orchards because he wanted to uh, start again to put together grazing and olive making as it was in the past. I can imagine wolves arriving here in Florence between, between Fiesole and the city. <laughs> well, it's interesting. But the most interesting thing was the discussion. The chair of the, of the Department of Environment, a lady, a nice lady, like a colleagues, she was having a nervous breakdown. Say, what, what the hell do you want me to do to kill the wolf? I said, you're crazy, they are protected all over Europe. They will kill me, they will fire me the next day. And when the... The vice minister came here in Tuscany, called by the farmers, because these are not the problem of this friend of mine in the Villa di Maiano, these are problem of the farmers all over. He said, listen, I totally agree with you. Well, we have not a single chance to go in the parliament, to discuss with the majority of the population, and to go to Brussels, in Europe, and tell them that we need to kill all these wild animals that are destroying the cultivation. You understand? I can tell you that you're right here. But I'm not going to the newspaper, on the TV, or in the parliament saying that we are allowing something like that. So this is the situation. What is happening here is that the, idea, the ideas, as I said, are important. So there has been a change in the culture, a change in the ideas behind conservation, environment, uh, and uh, the idea, the current idea, the majority of the, of the people uh, think in a different way. Uh, from the scientific point of view, there is a uh, something is missing. There is the lack of a dynamic view of biodiversity. Of course, the biodiversity that we can also have today in an area which is abandoned by the man is not the one that was there before the man was existing. The domestication of species has been occurring since Neolithic time. So if we are fixed in an idea of only preserving certain number of species, those, I have to say, on which most of the attention of the public is concentrated, of course, we are creating a habitat for the wolf, a habitat for the bear. There is a huge project creating a habitat for the bears, a continuous habitat from Sweden to Italy. Now, I would like you to, to be aware what is the size of a habitat of a bear. It's not just a garden <laughs> of a villa. It's mean two or three hundred square kilometers minimum. And if you protect these 300 square kilometers, protection means that nobody can affect that habitat without going into jail, and because the European law is uh, very clear about that, we, we are really in trouble if we don't change the perspective. So the global changes, challenge that I see in sustainable development, just to making a complex thing a bit easier for speaking about us, the climate change, which says that uh, to try to reduce this temperature increase with all the consequences that uh, you always hear, we need to have more forests as carbon sinks and biodiversity. And from the other, we have another challenge, uh, FAO saying that, okay, if we want to increase uh, of, by 70% the food production in the next, uh, next 50 years, we need more farming, more farm at land. And the two things are difficult to obtain. Because at, at what we are doing in Europe and in Italy, we are a bit uh, contradictory. Our ecological footprint includes also the land that somebody else is cultivating, 
to give us the wheat or the cereals that we eat. And this calculation should be included. And it's called, if we just uh, say that we are sustainable, only looking at the fact that we are protecting nature, having uh, wildlife and having more forest, uh, um, sustainability also means to rely on your own resources. And thinking to Italy, I, logically I would say that we need to restore the cultivated land that we had before. Just also for the reason of offering you the reality, which means pasta, or pizza, or whatever, is made in Italy. But although, for fortune, we are in, a, in an international environment, nobody's listening, the reality is that we are importing wheat from abroad for producing our pasta. And selling, not only to you, but also to Italians. But if you try to put this on the table at the ministerial level, and they tell you more or less the same thing that the vice minister told me. So what are you proposing? Remove the forest to cultivate more land? Forget it. So we are continuing uh, in a sort of uh, uh, idea that requires for me a paradigm shift. We've been passing from an idea of the natural system and the socioeconomic system mostly isolated on the earth with some part of the two where they overlapped, where we had an interaction between man and nature, to an idea of the 90s with the, the climate change theory, where we realized that the natural system is included now in the socioeconomic system. We should go to another paradigm, realize that we are all living in a biocultural system. There is not a single spot on the earth that has not been affected by the man, which means that also the, what we call nature is different. It's been changed by the man. And so this means that we change the way also we look at things like uh, biodiversity. And in fact, finally, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and UNESCO agreed that there was a need for a different paradigm. So they developed this program called uh, uh, Linkages Between Cultural and Biological Diversity, which is exactly trying to say, okay, there are, for now to say, areas of the world, but they consider Europe and Italy a typical example, the entire Euro con European continent, where the two things cannot be separated. They're all together. And in fact, in the Florence Declaration, which is the declaration where they've been implementing this program, they write uh, the rural territory is mostly a biocultural landscape and it continues, should be managed accordingly. It means, in, uh, in practical reason, that I cannot create uh, what I call a protected area somewhere next to a farm at land and say, okay, this is another thing. The man should not disturb, no. We put the man and the farmer at the center of the system. The center of the system means that they're taking care of the quality of the environment as they take care of the quality of the landscape, as they are developing their own, own economic activity, as they're also playing a, a role for the society because landscape is also for the entire society. So the change here is the one that say, okay, the man is not only uh, a factor of disturbance. And so we consider whether he's good or bad according to how much he's disturbing. No, here the man should be at the center, especially the farmer, especially uh, traditional farming practices that are creating this nice landscape. And so the idea that uh, there is an advantage of taking care of cultural landscape uh, considering the food production, consider the environmental quality, consider a high quality of life, because also in this managed landscape, there is a biodiversity, of course, and that can be the same biodiversity that you have in Amazonia, let's say, there is the biodiversity that we have in Italy, and which is being created long ago, and perhaps we might have some wolves, but not too many, because we are 200 people for square kilometers. And this makes a difference between an area where you have only two people for square kilometers, which means a lot of place for other life forms. Because at the end, something which is not understood, that there has also been a competition on the earth between men and the rest of the life forms to survive. 
farming is not happen by chance, it means millennium of hard work. And this, some of these are good example of how the, th the things can be kept together. You can develop a, a vineyard, if you like vineyards, on a mountain slope, respecting the mountain, not causing erosion, uh, or in the plain. Taking care of the different quality of the environment. You were before explaining from the garden perspective. Uh, okay, the way these branches are managed low down on the soil, we are in Sicily, is according to the fact that here we have a very hot climate. And so they take advantage of the heat of the soil and of the sun to ripen. Instead, in the Etruscan time, they were growing the vines on the trees because it was humid. And the vines don't like humidity and they need to go away from the soil and go closer to the sun. And so these are things that you don't find in a textbook of, textbook of agriculture, but the people knew since. And you find this in, in many other areas in Italy. We are now in uh, Pantelleria in Sicily. You see these olive trees, they are one meter high. They are protected by stone walls because there you have a strong wind, salty wind, and so olives are not growing is they're not protected. So the harvest is done like this, not like here in Tuscany. And we put also the landscape of Pantelleria in the expo in Milan, just as an example of a landscape which is, as has always been, the result of the adaptation of the man to very different uh, uh, climatic and other environmental condition. Because you can grow olive trees, as you see, in many different ways. Uh, creating also beautiful places. Uh, important for the history, important for the cultural identity, and especially in this period, cultural identity and the protection of cultural identity is very important. Mm, uh, taking the example of Europe, there is a difficult process of European integration because we have so many different countries, so many different regions, so people don't feel represented. Taking care of each landscape, of each different cultural identity represented by the landscape is a way of telling them, I'm, I'm taking care of you. I know that you're there and I respect you. So the fact that you have your own landscape, that you can recognize your own landscape and all, not all the landscape becomes the same is, from my point of view, crucial. As also I was saying, we need to recognize that this is a chestnut orchard being planted. This is one of my students. So I'm fine that it is included in the natural protected areas. What I'm concerned is about the management plan. Is the management plan said that needs to evolve towards nature, towards the climax, it means that I'm losing these monumental trees that are 300 years old. I want to protect them. The same thing in this, you see, this is considered, is in, in the list, uh, we are in Abruzzo here, of the natural monuments. I don't care that you call it a cultural monument, but please be aware that this is the result of pruning made up by farmers to produce fodder in medieval time to feed the sheep, because there was not enough fodder. So you need to have help from the trees. No chemical fertilizer, nothing, I'm just, modifying the tree in order to have this. So if you say that the shepherds, it has happened here, cannot go there with the sheep and prune the tree because you need to leave this hab habitat untouched. And to, from my point of view, it doesn't make sense. And all over the world, we are in the Philippines here, in the north, uh, in the Cordillera of the Luzon uh, Island, you see example of this adaptation. Of course, this is done removing the forest. They develop rice terraces, stone terraces, uh, with an incredible work. Or we had other example of adaptation. We are in the Canary Island, Lanzarote. Here they have a volcanic eruption some centuries ago. So the chances were I leave because no farming possible, or I get smart. And I say, okay, what do the vineyards or the fruit trees need? They need heat. They need to be protected from the wind. Okay, so let's dig a hole and put uh, these uh, stone walls in the direction of the prevailing wind. And then I have the fruit tree. 
And this is an incredible example of adaptation, but the oasis in all the northern part of Africa from, uh, are a good example of this. So there is a wisdom, there is a logic in this that we need to say, both as an immaterial heritage, the idea, the knowledge, how these traditional practices be maintained, but also from the physical point of view, areas that are example of sustainable development, I would say, that we need to take care of. So in this respect, what are my conclusion, just to come to an end? And cultural landscape are not yet fully recognized as a fundamental perspective for sustainable development, as far as I can see from the different level with whom I'm working. Most of the legislation on landscape protection is still based on tools developed for nature conservation, not really for cultural landscapes. International programs and policies rarely recognize their importance for the economic development, for the environmental quality, and the quality of life of the rural territory. And Italy can still be perhaps a good example of this possibility to integrate uh, nature and culture, because at the end you need positive example to show when you're presenting these cases. And to come into my last slide, what we did in Italy. Well, in 2002, we had the new law allowing, allowing landscape restor the restoration, sorry, this is a <laughs> that's not correct, the restoration of cultural landscape, which means you can remove the wood grown over an historical landscape and be back. We established a national observatory for rural landscape. We established the national register of historical landscape. The research I was showing you was very lucky because the president of the Republic, Giorgio Napolitano, was very much interested in creating this. Uh, and we have now a monitoring system for rural landscape, which means we are taking under control with remote sensing all these 120 areas and we regularly check what is uh, happening. This is, for us, uh, it's already uh, a huge change uh, and, well, it was interesting to explain how difficult it was to develop these tools, but uh, I think uh, we are on the right track. Thank you very much. The, the, the second point uh, that for the biodiversity, I totally agree. It's just that, in scientific terms, the amount of literature explaining this uh, is uh, lower than the amount of literature saying that there is more biodiversity. And it's also difficult to publish, I have to tell you. Because in order to say something different when you have sort of a globalized thinking, you know, uh, the idea needs to be stronger and also it's more difficult to produce also a good research but having an editor of a journal which writes you saying exactly like this, uh, dear professor, yes, it's a good topic, I understand it is important, but in our current uh, structure of our editing profile, we cannot accept a paper like this. You try another, another publication, another journal. For the other thing, uh, the discussion is very important now with my ministry, food production. Hmm? So from the ecological point of view, as you were saying before, uh, Obviously, this modern landscape have a higher energetic input, hmm, but they are less efficient. Because in order to produce four or five times more per hectare, you need to put there 10 times more energy. So at the end, although you can increase the production, the, 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 the fact is that you are consuming more energy, and this means more pollution and so on. If I have to think, for instance, of having mm, uh, animal grazing instead of keeping them in a stable, that means, of course, that you have a, an extensification of the views of the land. And this has a limit in terms of production. So I can use a lot of land, as I saw, recovering it from abandonment. Uh, if you put together population need in terms of calories, as we have today, which is not the same thing that they had in the past, and uh, the size uh, of the land that you have in countries like mine, there's clearly a, a, a limit to this. So in terms of sustainable development, FAO also is thinking about this kind of thing. You know? Can we really try to push this low intensity farming and taking care of all the things that you were saying all over the world as a model for achieving a sustainability of food production which allow everyone to have food? This is, uh, ideally I'm with you, I, I totally agree. <laughs> Well, with the data that we have here is we can get us to, for instance, 30, uh, 300 
kilo, uh, sei, uh, quintali. Uh, sono 350, 30, 30 quintal per hectare, compared to 55 with chemical fertilizer and high intensity uh, farming. Mm. So, it's good if you can combine, as the Truscan we are doing, different production on the same plot of land. In this case, you put them all together, you have an advantage. That, that data is really not well supported. So the, um, you can find agricultural, polycultural systems in the United States that have very high production. And in some cases, they may be even higher than average agricultural production in certain places, right? The, the Rodale Institute, for example, makes this kind of calculation constantly. Um, but if you really do meta-analysis on this, you know, statistically, you find that it's not the case across the agricultural landscape. It would be kind of like taking the, the highest um, producing corn farm in Iowa and comparing it to the average, you know, something else farm somewhere. It's, not, it's comparing apples to oranges. It's a very argued statistical point, and it's really not well supported in the literature, but it does point to a possibility. I just have a point I'd like to make. I'm fortunate enough to own 13 hectares in Chianti, which um, is a beautiful cultural landscape, absolutely gorgeous with the old terraces, the vite maritate, all of these wonderful things. My husband and I are not farmers, but we are going to become farmers because the province of Siena has said, yes, you can have a fence to defend from your boar and from your deer, but you better start producing some food. So there is the positive side of things. We are now going to become farmers. Thank you.